to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for a long time israel has been without the true god without a teaching priest, and without law. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Welcome to our study of the Old Testament books as we think today about 2 Chronicles. Many times when studying these books, people can become bogged down in the names and the genealogies and the history that they may not be real familiar with and miss some of the powerful, relevant messages of 2 Chronicles. As we have mentioned before, Romans 15, 4 says the things that were written before time were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might find hope. That tells the child of God that the old law has been written with a purpose of them in mind. That is, they can take that old law and learn living messages, practical, relevant teachings about God and how He relates to man that will help us today. And so as we think about 2 Chronicles, the key ideas are restoration and worship. God is trying to get Israel to restore the rightful place to Him by leaving sin, by giving up following the ungodly heathen people, and by worshiping Him correctly. Key verse is 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14 where God pleads with His people, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, God goes on to say, I will forgive and I will heal the people and their land. God's plea through Solomon and through others is that they must put God first and God will always be faithful to His promises, promises if His people trust in Him. Now, Key phrase, 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 19 mentions the idea of those who prepare their heart. Friend, a lot of the Bible is about making my heart what it ought to be. And please understand, when we talk about the heart, we're not talking about the blood pump, the organism or muscle in our chest. For the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. God is here encouraging men and women to prepare their heart. What's that mean? To prepare their mind, to put Him first. Matthew 6, 33, to be faithful unto death. Revelation 2, verse 10, and to put God's laws and God's teachings in our hearts and in our minds. Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12. As you think about 2 Chronicles, the book uniquely divides into these categories. Chapters 1 through 9 in 2 Chronicles tells us about the righteous reign of Solomon. Much of his reign was righteous. There are times when he fell away, but the reign of Solomon and the potential that he started out with and the bad things that got in the way for Solomon. Then chapters 10 through 36 talks to us about the road to captivity. And this is the, the tragic picture of the declining state of Israel under ungodly kings as an ungodly nation. And the end result is when God has to punish Israel and her kings for their sin. And so Solomon takes the first nine chapters and the last few chapters of the book or the last part of the book is about Israel's downfall. Now, as we think about 2 Chronicles, what kind of messages and what kind of teachings can we learn from this book? Well, right away we learn in God's address to Solomon as he is thinking about the temple and as he is preparing his heart for worship and to, to seek God Almighty. We learn that God does not dwell 
in temples made with hands as so many have envisioned. And as was part of worship during that time, they often looked for the temple as the place of worship. But in Acts chapter 7, Stephen quotes from the old law and says, God does not dwell, dwell, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands as the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What place shall you build for me or where is the place of my dwelling? You know, as I read 2 Chronicles and I see the beautiful imagery and the ornate detail of that temple, I need to be reminded that that temple is not God and that God is not just contained in that temple, that God rules and reigns everywhere. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The psalmist said in Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2, and a, a man-made building cannot contain or house the Almighty who fills all places and is everywhere. Psalm 139 verses 1 through 12, the psalmist said, If I go into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. In the darkest, deepest place, God can be there because God created all these things. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. Hebrews 4 verse 13 says, All things are naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. All things are open and naked before God, and thus God is not contained to a building. Now, here's a real practical lesson that we need to learn from that, and that is the Lord's church is not the building, and the building does not contain God. You see, under the Old Testament, the people had put their hopes so much in the building that in time of great distress, here's what they cried out. Jeremiah 7 verse 4, the people of Israel cried out, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. What were they saying? Save us, O our temple. And yet it was not the temple who saved and ultimately those people went into captivity because their sanctuary had become their cemetery. They let the place where they went to worship God be as their salvation. Friend, today in the Lord's church, the church is not the building. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, verses 25 through 27, to Christians, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. How do I know that the church is not the building? Because when people obeyed the gospel, in Acts chapter 2 they heard that gospel message preached and they repented and were baptized for the remission of their sins. And verse 47 says, The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved, added to the number of the saved those who are currently being saved. And so what is the church? It's the collection, it's the group of the saved. Does God dwell in His people through the Word and as they live their life according to His teaching? But let's not limit God to one place. For when we do, we've taken God who encompasses everything and tried to put Him in a neat little package like we would like, and that's not how God works. What else do we learn about God from 2 Chronicles or what lessons can we learn? God sometimes used the nations to punish His people. I want you to listen to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and I want you to notice what is said in verse 17 about God using the nations to punish His people. Listen to verse 17. The Bible says, Therefore He, God, brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion on the young man or the virgin, on the age or the weak. He gave them all into His hand. Well, why did the God of heaven, who chose Israel, who made them His special people, why did He allow this evil Chaldean king to come in and do these things? in His sanctuary and to His people. Friend, there's only one reason, and it's the rebellion and sin of God's people. Did God want this to happen? No. God wanted to save His people, to make them His own special people, and God did continue to work through the remnant. But those who got caught up in sin, and those who continually hardened their heart and rebelled against the Almighty, God used the nations around them to punish them. 
Friend, from this we learn a very practical lesson, and the powerful aspect of it for, uh, is this. We must make sure that our hearts are softened to the will of God so that God doesn't have to use these external forces to get us to see the error of our way and, and maybe even bring catastrophe and calamity upon us. Does God still use these forces? Perhaps, as Paul would say in the book of Philemon, but we know that God is able to use those things as He did in the past to wake His people up and to punish them for their sin. Now, here's another very practical lesson. I want you to notice 2 Chronicles chapter 5 in verses 12 and 13. At the dedication and building of this great temple, the glory of God takes its presence in that temple. 2 Chronicles 5, listen to verses 12 through 13. The scripture here records for us, And the Levites, who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Judathan, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, with them 120 priests, sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass, when the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make sound to be heard, and praising and thanking the Lord, when they lifted up their voice with the trumpet and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good. His mercy endures forever that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. What is this picture all about? Here are people whose hearts have been made soft to the will of God, who have made great sacrifice and, and dedication in building this temple to honor God, and now with heartfelt emotion, they come together to sing and praise God, and, and God is impressed with their worship to the point that His presence fills that temple. Friend, there's another very practical lesson that we learn from this teaching, and it's this. When people gather to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, John 4, verse 24, and as He's commanded in the Word, Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2, the presence of God is still with His people. When we gather to worship, we're in the very presence of God. We are the audience. We are the participants and God is the audience and He is viewing our worship. And if our worship honors God, is according to spirit and truth, is with our whole heart, soul, mind, and body, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, Mark 12, verses 30 and 31, then God is just as happy with our worship as He was in 2 Chronicles 5. But for it to be that way, We've got to make sure we worship God correctly and that we're doing exactly what the Bible says. Now, another very practical lesson from 2 Chronicles is found in chapter 6, verse 30. And this teaches us that the God of heaven, He knows our hearts. Notice 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 30. Solomon says to God, Then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, notice this, for you alone know the hearts of the sons of men. It ought to be comforting if I'm living and doing like I ought to. It ought to comfort me to know that God knows my heart. You see, the same is true for us today. Acts 1 verse 24, God knew what was in the heart of man. John 2 verse 25, Jesus knows What's in the heart of men? Acts 15, 24, God knows our hearts. No, nothing is secret from God. Even the secret things, the thing we think are secret, on the day of judgment, those will be brought out. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. And so my mind, what I think, even though I may not say it, the things I think, I'll give an account of those. Every thought must be brought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. And so is our heart really what it ought to be with God? Is my heart pure? Meaning that I try to think about the things that are good and just and noble and right. 
Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. Do I have true love for God in my heart? John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And do I love my neighbor as myself? You remember the two greatest commandments? Jesus was asked by a lawyer, Lord, what are the greatest commandments? Jesus said the first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, like unto it is, love your neighbor as yourself. God knows my heart and God knows your heart. And if we think we're fooling God, friend, we're in for a rude awakening. So we must be cognizant of the fact that the maker of mankind is aware of what's in our heart even when we don't express it with our mouth. Another powerful lesson in 2 Chronicles is that in our battles, in our struggles, just as in the time of Israel, so it is today in my battles, I need to remember, the battle belongs to God. Notice 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse number 15. The Bible says in verse 13, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And here's what this man said. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. Listen, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The people didn't know whether they were going to win or lose. Some were getting discouraged. Some had become faint-hearted. And the king himself looks that way. And so this great man of God says, Listen up. The battle belongs not to you, but to God. How encouraging it is today to know that as I fight the good fight of faith, 1 Timothy 6, verses 10 through 20, as I wage war spiritually against the host of wickedness, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12, as I wake every day to be sober and vigilant against my adversary, the devil, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, how good it is to know that the battle still belongs to God. And friend, if I will take up the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, verses 13 through 18, if I will fight with every ounce and fiber of my being, God still promises us the victory. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. It's such an encouraging passage. The Bible says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the good news is, we've already on, we're already on the winning side if we're God's children. Do you remember Revelation 12, verse 11? The Bible says of Christians, They overcame Him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. If I will follow their pattern, the blood of the Lamb, that's Jesus' sacrifice, if I obey the gospel and I contact the blood of Jesus in baptism, Romans 6, 1 through 4, the word of their testimony, that is the word of God today, which is a perfect road map, Psalm 119, 105, and by not loving our lives to the death. That is self-sacrifice. Sacrifice of Jesus, Scripture, and self-sacrifice makes us sure that we can overcome the enemy and truly we can honor and praise God because the battle does still belong to the Lord. Now, I want you to see as we think about the kings of Israel along the way, there were some kings who made good steps and who made good reforms. The bad outweighed the good kings, but we want to highlight a couple of good ones. Notice in your Bible, 2 Chronicles chapter 15, and here are a couple of good kings. We'll look at a couple. Ver chapter 15, verses 2 and 3, mention some of the good reforms Asa initially did. The Bible says in verse 2, of Asa, he went out to meet Asa. This is the prophet. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you for a long time. 
Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without the law. And so Asa begins to establish some good reforms. But what this man of God said is so practical for us today. God is with me and on my side as long as I'm with Him and as long as I put Him first. Isn't this what Jesus taught us? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things, food, shelter, clothing, shall be added unto you. If I'll make God now my number one priority, here's the promises I have. The Lord has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, what shall man do to me? Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. The promise I have is, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past, present, and future, if I'll put God first, I have the promise that Christ will be with me and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 verse 13, but on the flip side of that, just as the man of God said here in 2 Chronicles 15, if you forsake the Lord, He'll forsake you. Meaning that God can't have anything to do with sin. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, the Bible says that our God is of pure eyes than to behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. Because of sin, God has to sever Himself from man. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, And all the blessings and benefits I lose when I enter into a life of sin and I separate myself from the Almighty. And so the encouragement is, be faithful unto death and God will always do His part. Then let's think about good King Hezekiah. I want you to take your Bible and look with me in 2 Chronicles 29 and let's notice some of the good reforms that King Hezekiah made in this book. Chapter 29, look beginning in verse number 1 as Hezekiah cleanses the temple. The Bible says Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Verse 2, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Well, what do you mean he did what was right? Verse 3, In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites. Goes on to tell us that he sanctified them. He got the temple like it ought to be, and he cleansed that temple from ungodliness and sin. Now you remember, in the history of Israel, so at times, they didn't even know where their Bible was. 2 Kings 22, the Bible had actually, the Word of God had actually got lost in the temple of God. And yet here, Hezekiah, he goes in, he cleanses the temple, he sanctifies the priest, and he gets things like they ought to be. Friend, before a person can worship God, his heart needs to be right with the Almighty. Do you remember in Paul's instructions concerning the Lord's Supper? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, about verses 23 through 28, the Apostle Paul tells us, us that, tells us that we first need to examine ourselves before we partake of the Lord's Supper. I've got to make sure my life's right and that my life doesn't have sin that I'm harboring inside of it or that I'm not fooling, trying to fool God and others. And so we need to have the fortitude to do what's right and to examine ourselves. That's what the Scripture teaches. Second Chronicles or Second Corinthians 13 verse 5, the Bible says, Test yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Now, in Second Chronicles 29, about verse number 20, Hezekiah, good king Hezekiah, then begins to restore true worship. Notice in verse 20 following. Then Hezekiah rose early, gathered the rulers of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. Then he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord and they began to go here and worship God. 
But before they enter that action of worship, they want to make sure that they've got themselves right and that they're prepared to worship God correctly. Friend, not any worship is acceptable to God. The worship must be the kind that God wants. Well, what kind is God looking for? The Bible says in John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is seeking men and women who will worship Him according to their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and who will worship Him according to truth. Well, what does it mean to worship according to truth? We ask first, what is truth? Like Pilate in John 18, verses 36 through 38, we want to know, what is truth? Well, Jesus has already answered that. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This book contains all truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And so we ask, are we really worshiping God in spirit and in truth? Are we really putting the principles of this book before what we want and what we think is right? And friend, just as importantly, or maybe even more importantly, I've got to make sure that I am truly a child of God. There are a lot of people who will say various ways of salvation and give you various ways of salvation that you just don't find in this book. But here's what the Bible does say you must do to become a Christian. The Scripture says you must first hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Having heard that Word, I must believe in Jesus. John 8, 24 Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. Having believed, I must repent. For unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. Having repented, I must make that good confession. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Romans 10, verse 10. And as Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. I must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Friend, is your heart right with God? Are you sure that you're a child of God? If not, we encourage you today, obey the gospel so you can be sure all is well with God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, this not your wallet. The gospel of Christ, and to we God encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video glory, copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.